I am a truth seeker. Okay. Um, I am using the tool of asking questions <clears throat> to dive deep into reality to figure out what's the truth of a situation. That's the core of my work. Whether I'm teaching, um, speaking, writing, being, it's all about truth seeking. How do I help people ask the better question and very specifically ask a very tough catalytic question, one that, one that takes on a fundamental assumption that everybody's holding is true but in fact is false? First of all, the leaders themselves have to realize they're living in isolation. Walt Bedinger, the CEO of Charles Schwab, said it's his number one challenge. People start telling him what they think he wants to hear and they stop telling him what they think he doesn't want to hear. Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar and Disney Animation Studios, calls it the dangerous disconnect. And here's how that happens. When leaders at the top, so number one, I get to the top of organization, positionally I have power, then I might also be the most expert person in that organization, tick that into the system, then I might also <clears throat> own the organization, put that into the system, and then I might also be quite charismatic or well-known in the world, put that in the system. You add three or four of those things together and leaders at the top are just set up. They're framed to be blindsided by what they don't know they don't know because people will stop telling the information they need to get and asking the questions that will make them uncomfortable, that will open that window to what they don't know they don't know. So, what do I recommend to leaders, whether they're at the top or even at the bottom of an organization? is go out of your way, get up, get out of your office, get out of your building, get into the world, be with people who are exactly the opposite of you, in places that you're normally not in, and when we're in those sorts of situations, we end up being wrong and uncomfortable, and it almost forces us to be quiet. And when that happens, New questions surface. Either we ask them in our head or the people around us ask them. And it's usually on the edge or fringe in a system. And when we behave that way as leaders, when we go into the places and with the people who we might even have an intuition, I'm going to be uncomfortable there. That's the place from which I surface the passive data that's not actively coming at me. And that holds the key to the insights I need and the questions I need to be asking to change the direction of this organization, or even myself. So it's a very interesting question about do we ask and be asked questions? And in either situation, Michael Sippy, who's the VP of product at Medium now, used to be at Twitter doing the same thing, he said, here's how I ask the right questions. I put myself in situations that cause me to ask the different question, and that's the challenge. If you or I live in an isolated echo chamber. And that could be literally within my office, it could be within my floor, it could be within my building. Those are the most profound and useless echo chambers on planet Earth. Is if that's the only place we operate, we are set up to fail. And so the way to get out of that, the way to either ask or be asked a better question, is to get in a situation where, whoa, I had no idea that's what was going on. So one executive at an organization, online organization, that delivers packages all over the world, at their warehouse facility where they're putting things together and distributing them, they had a problem there, which was people felt like they weren't being fairly paid. And he felt like they were. And I asked him the question, what do you see in the people's eyes when they complain about the pay? And his answer was, he thought for a minute, he said, I haven't been in that warehouse for a long time, and I don't know what's in their eyes. And you know, if he walks into that warehouse, he's in a space now where he's likely to be wrong, uncomfortable, and if he just shuts up, if he just, be, if he just stays quiet long enough, people will realize he's interested in what they have to say and what they have to ask. And it's that kind of data that makes all the difference. It's interesting that in our time and age, 
we, we often now think of social media and online as our echo chamber. And undoubtedly it is, because so much of our information is coming in that way. But you know, just track yourself. You know, we sit on airplanes and we watch the flight patterns of our airplanes that they're taking us from A to B. Track ourselves with our own travel patterns when we wake up in the morning. Where do we go? Who are we with? How, how repetitive is that? How similar is it day after day? And if the answer is, yeah, it's looking pretty much the same over and over, the people and the places I'm at, I've just created my echo chamber that's no different than what gets created for me by the algorithms online. Mm -hmm. And in either situation, if I'm not actively going out of my way to get surprised, to be wrong, to be uncomfortable, again, by going to people in other places that don't see the world like me, 180 degree opposite sort of folks, if I'm not actively out there doing that, I will get blindsided. And it could be me, it could be my team, it could be a company, it could be a country, and unfortunately, at the end of the day, it could be the world. But in any of those situations, it's looking at the routines, the patterns. The fourth industrial revolution, it's real. I work at MIT, and I'm the dumbest person there. These are amazing people who do amazing things to solve the world's most difficult challenges. They're creating that revolution. They're in the middle of that whole process. And one of the things we care deeply about as we do that at MIT is that we're asking the right questions. What are we solving for? The solutions matter, but what's the point? And what's the impact? And are we paying attention to that? Right at the moment, it's a culmination of a lifetime of figuring out what causes people to ask the right questions. I cared about it as a little kid growing up in my home. I've cared about it as a professional studying leaders for the last 30 years. And some of the most effective leaders in that whole sort of context have been the people who ask the right questions. Now everybody kind of nods their heads. Yeah, I get that. Questions are important. But then follow up with, well, I work for you and I don't know quite how to ask the right question. How do you do that? 80% of the leaders I deal with, they come up absolutely dumbfounded on that question. They don't know how to tell somebody else how to ask the better question. Just do it. Which is frankly useless when you're trying to help somebody ask better questions. So I've had the chance, really the opportunity, the privilege in fact, of interviewing more than 200 of some of the most amazing questioners on planet Earth. Ed Catmull one of the key people at Pixar for decades, um, president of Disney and Pixar Animation Studios now. Maureen Chiquet used to be the CEO of Chanel. I could go through the people, but they're really interesting, really good questioners. And I asked them, how do you do it? What causes you to do it? Their answer was consistently, I put myself in situations that are so, that are so different from my normal every everyday routine of life that I am wrong and I am uncomfortable for it and I'm forced to be quiet. Mark Benioff, from getting the idea initially to put data from an enterprise on the cloud to the innovations they do today at Salesforce, he goes on listening sprees, listening journeys, where he literally, for weeks at a time, will just go listen where he's wrong and uncomfortable in order to get data that other people don't get. And it opens up windows that other people can't see through. So that's what they do. And so I'm writing a book about those stories of, of these leaders who are exceptional at not only asking great questions, but getting great answers. And the other part of it is I discovered that what they do in everyday life is something that you and I can do in a very short period of time around any challenge that we care about. I call it the question burst. So imagine you or I have a challenge. We're stuck. We care about it, but we've really worked on it, but we don't have a solution. What do we do? We're often frustrated, we're in a negative emotional space. Here's my suggestion. Get a timer, set it for four minutes, and follow two rules, either yourself or with somebody else. Rule number one, for four minutes, well, three rules actually. Rule number one, generate nothing but questions about the challenge. Rule number two, don't answer any of the questions. Rule number three, don't explain to yourself or anybody else why you're asking the question. And if you follow those rules for four minutes, 80% of the time, the data would tell us, you and I will have a reframe challenge. We will feel more positive about the situation. 
we will also have at least one new idea that we might be able to solve this thing, all from four minutes. That's because we live in a world that is deeply and fundamentally answer-centric. When we're in schools, the average child sitting in a classroom for one hour during a course of a month asks one question per month about the content of the course. Same thing in universities. Unfortunately, same thing in most work organizations. And so we've, we've, we've fallen into this trap, this hole of answers are everything. But my answer to that is questions are the answers. And this method of question burst actually allows us to ask different questions that open up different vistas that take us down different paths that make all the difference. Thinkers 50 to me is an opportunity to converse with people who think deeply about where the world is and where it's going. You know, there are amazing women and men here who have spent a lifetime trying to explore what causes leaders to be better at what they do. And it's a unique event in the sense that we now have a chance to interact with each other that otherwise we wouldn't be doing in our busy lives like everyone else. And in that spirit, I've already today, as part of Thinkers 50, walked away with two or three questions that I had never asked before that will inform my work and hopefully the impact I have on the rest of the world.